It specifically excludes religious services. Good deal. Excellent. Well, hey, welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. Uh, it has been an interesting week, has it not? Nonetheless, we are survived Thanksgiving and a, a lot of COVID cases this week, and we'll be worshiping in person and online uh, for here at the Wesley and uh, for, the sort, for the foreseeable future online on YouTube. So however you're here, we're glad you're with us. Now, today, our theme this morning is going to be, again, in Ecclesiastes, and it is my joy to introduce you to uh, this chapter, which is a master's class on how to make sense of life and meaning of life in a broken world and to find Christ in our world. Uh, and, and so I'm hopeful that you will be blessed through it and praying in that regard. I want to also introduce you to uh, a man named Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford is a Scottish minister from the 1600s. Uh, we are a confessional church, and, and he was one of the six Scottish commissioners to the Westminster uh, Assembly. And, and what he's best known for is not that, but his letters. And he's wrote these beautiful letters that are, uh, there's about 350 of them. And one of the letters uh, is on, there's a quote actually on our PowerPoint, uh, which begins with Did Christ. And I want to read this to you as we prepare for the service this morning. It says this, Give Christ your virgin love, you cannot put your heart and love into a better hand. Oh, if you knew him and saw his beauty, your love, your liking, your heart would close with him and cleave to him. Oh, fair sun and fair moon and fair stars and fair flowers and fair roses and fair lilies and fair creatures. But oh, 10,000 times fairer, Lord Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful words of devotion about Christ. Fairer 10,000 times over than the fairest. All right. This morning, let's bow our hearts and we'll begin with a call to worship. All right, if, you'll be, uh, if you would please stand with me. Our call to worship this morning is going to be from Isaiah 9 and Psalm 98. And as we approach Christmas season, Advent season as they call it, um, we'll be looking at a few of the Christmas texts. And this is one of the most famous ones uh, where we talk about the names of Jesus. And it's interesting, is it not, that of the four names, if you look at the second line there that the people say, one of the four names is Everlasting Father. This is Christ. He's going to be called Everlasting Father. And why would he be called that? Well, he's going to make known the Father's love to his people. Uh, this is what, what, is, what it will be like to be uh, in the Father's presence. If you've seen the Father, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So as you're looking at this, thinking about this, uh, note, as we have on the slide coming up in a minute, that uh, Father is the Christian name for God. This is unique to uh, the Christian faith, is that we, along with Jesus, pray to him and say, Our Father. Uh, and that's through the mediation of Christ uh, that we're able to do that. All right, now let's, conf- or let's call to worship this morning from the Word of God together. It says, For us, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, you have, met, you have manifest your glory in the works of creation, in the works of forming the universe, the cosmos, all the galaxies. And you fashioned every little detail into its order. You've made all things for your purposes. 
You declared all of history before it happens. And you've gathered us today to worship you. You've set forward one day out of seven to worship you uh, in, in your creation mandates. And we ask now that as we worship you, as we sing to you, as we pray to you, as we read your word and hear it preached and see it demonstrated in the, in the sacrament, we ask that in all these things that that would not just be bare word, which is powerful in and of itself, but that it would be made powerful to salvation of our souls, powerful to our sanctification of our souls, that your spirit would breathe life into us and meet with us today and lead us to Christ, lead us by the hand, that we might call out and say, fairest Lord Jesus, fairer than 10,000 times all the fair suns and moons and all the things we could, we could look upon with our eyes and gaze at. Lord, we long to gaze at you. And so this morning, as we meet together, would we uh, spiritually be communing with you, seeing the glory of our Father in heaven through the face of the Son. Lord, as we open up your word, would, it, would, the, would the pages breathe forth life into our weary souls? As we meet today with a shadow of, of sicknesses and friends who are, have been lost, friends who have uh, passed away, friends who are, are sick, friends who are quarantined, Lord, as we meet in person today, Lord, would you uh, call us to find all these things to be medicine from you as we suffer, as we, as we go through trials with these things, lead us to your righteous and good hand. Lord, we, we trust your sovereignty. We ask that you would lead us today for your glory and for your name's sake, for us to be made more in the image of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray now according to the example you gave your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first hymn is a great and wonderful Christmas hymn. It says, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. 195. Not, not has come, did come, is present here with us. Joy to the world. 195 in our hymnals. Let's just sing together. seated. We're going to hear 
a lesson about the Lord who is come, who is come. Listen to verse 11 through 14 of the Gospel of John, the first chapter. It says, He, Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Let's read now, confess our sins to our Heavenly Father through Jesus, uh, who has made us children born of God. Let's now pray together. O Lord Christ, we confess our willingness to be loved, but also our reluctance to love. We confess our readiness to accept your forgiving love, but also our refusal to forgive. We confess our eagerness to grasp your offer of redeeming love, but also our resistance to follow you without question. In this Advent time, forgive us our failure to respond as we should. Come to us anew, and by your grace, assist us to receive you with joy as the shepherds, with gratitude as Simeon, with obedience as Mary, with love as you have loved us. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you'll turn with me to the back of your hymnal, to 875, see the ordering of our readings this morning as we hear the gospel pardoning and we confess our sins out of the security of being adopted children and we listen to our Heavenly Father and His will for our lives. Where we find the will of God, we find it in His law. His law is not a uh, burden to children who are loved so well. We long to great, great, greatly and wonderfully serve Him. And so we do that by looking at the ninth commandment. In a world like ours, the ninth commandment is a commandment that seems like it's been forgotten, uh, where truth uh, is relevant, or, re- or not relevant, but relative, uh, where truth is obscured and used and, and things are shaded to be weapons. So we want to use a Christian ethic to be countercultural and distinguish the glory of God as we deal with truth in the midst of our neighbors, in the midst of our world, in the midst of our church. Truth is important because God is truth. And we reflect that as we demonstrate truthful dealings with our neighbor and ourselves. So let's look at these commandments, the ninth commandment, which is a a quote from Exodus 20, the ninth commandment, and then we're going to use as a tool to understand some of the meaning of what it required uh, for us with 77 and 78, which is what is required and what is forbidden in the ninth commandment. So If you will, I'll ask the question and we'll all say the answers together of questions 76 through 78 this morning. So I say, which is the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment is thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And then what is required in the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment requireth the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man and of our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. And what is forbidden in the ninth commandment? The ninth commandment forbidden whatsoever is prejudicial to truth or injurious to our own or our neighbor's good name. Amen. These are the word, these are the, uh, the guides that we've been given in our confession to better know how to serve God 
with truth for his glory. Uh, May they be useful. As we prepare to sing now a hymn of assurance, we realize that it is not our truth keeping that has justified us or will ever justify us. It is the grace of God that we are found in Christ as a truthful one who's kept the truth and kept God's laws for us that we might become his forevermore and be safe in his presence. So we're going to stand and sing, Not What My Hands Have Done, a hymn number 461 in the Trinity Hymnal. If you would, please stand. pray together for the offering. Our God in heaven, we give you thanks that it is your mercies alone that save us. Your mercies alone found liars like us and you reclaimed us. You wash us. You purify us. You cleanse us. And you call us righteous by the merits of Christ, our Savior, faithful and true, riding on the horse to deliver your people. Lord, you bring us home all the way and you, and you judge your enemies. We understand and confess that we are uh, only by your mercies and grace, not counted along with the enemies uh, who rebel against you, but by your mercies, we are called yours, called your children and get to sit at your table and enjoy all the blessings of the communion we have with you. So we ask, Lord, that in, in, in some of those blessings uh, out of the peace and assurance and joy we have and the love we feel from you, would you give us hearts that are givers of great and wonderful gifts, creating us a spirit of generosity and hospitality 
Make us leaders in hospitality and generosity. And, and through the offerings that your people give each and every week, would you build up your church into a faithful and, and blessed picture of the gospel. As we, as we love one another, as we demonstrate care for one another, we ask that you would do these things for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to remain standing for singing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. It's beautiful. I'll ask you now, Christian, what is it you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to lift up a few concerns this morning. Uh, that have been made known. So pray with me if you will. Lord, we call out to you because you have given us communion with you. You've forgiven our sins. We await the resurrection of our bodies. And we confess that one of our dear neighbors has entered into Uh, rest uh, this week Rose Kalinske we prayed for her recovery last week but in your will and providence you took her to be with you and so we do thank you for your hand in leading her home our hearts grieve with uh, the neighbors and family members and uh, Rose's uh, husband and, and two sons. and We ask that you would comfort them and work good out of this. Because we know that no path you lead us down is toward our destruction. But you lead us to pastures as a good shepherd. To food, to drink, to health. Where we know that this is a, a difficult and awful occurrence, tragedy, uh, in our, in, from our perspective. But would you work in it to make it work for the good and for your glory, as you promised to do. Lord, we ask that uh, as we examine our lack of immortality in our bodies, would you call us to draw closer to you? And rely upon your care and your help for our bodies. Lord, we ask that you would help us to better obey you through serving you with our bodies. Caring for our bodies as our gifts from you. And and use them for for your glory and for your sake. May we not squander any opportunities to glorify you. Because you're so good to us. Lord, we think of those who are caring for our neighbors and friends and uh, who are sick this week, and we ask for you to protect them and care for them. We pray especially for Robin and, and, her, and her ministry and service at Norman Regional. We pray for all those who are under her leadership and care that they would also be protected. And, and, and through her leadership and Christ-like uh, leadership, 
that they would find peace and trust in her leadership that would lead them ultimately to the Father in heaven. Lord, we ask that you'd be gracious to her in this time and gracious to uh, this, the workers and also those who are under care in their families in this time. We pray for our city leaders and our nation, national leaders and state leaders in times of, of difficult leadership. We ask that you would give them wisdom to govern rightly, justly, fairly, uh, that uh, all their decisions would be bringing you uh, and your people uh, better justice and, and, and being uh, within their realm of, of responsibility. Uh, Lord, we ask that this church, uh, that, you would be, that you would grow it, uh, even in the midst of a, a pandemic and challenging times, that you would grow us. We lift up our hands to you and say, help Help us to be a blessing in this city. That this church would be a church for Norman to, to lead so many to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to communion with you, Father. So it is with our hearts that we lift up to you these requests and ask you to help us. We pray also again for our friends, the Wamplers and, and their uh, sickness uh, today. We pray for Tammy's uh, scan this week, that it would go well and that uh, things would, would, would get back to normal for them. Uh, and, and many who are affected by this COVID as well, uh, including Tilly. We pray that uh, she would be well and that you would pr- uh, care for her and care for our faith as we look to you uh, in the midst of increasing, uh, uh, increasing suffering and uh, people being afflicted by this. We ask for you to keep us safe. We pray for those who are traveling even this day and pray for your uh, hand of blessing to be upon them as well. Pray for those who are watching this online. Would you speak mightily through the medium of, of YouTube even? Lord, would, they, would, they, would these things be a miracle to bring about sanctification and spiritual vitality to those who uh, log in on their computers? But we pray now for us in our hearts as we move into a time of children's worship and, and, and a time of hearing your word this morning, uh, we ask that, uh, that these things would lead us to worship you and to care for your glory and to rejoice in you. And all these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we move now into a time of Trinity Kids time, if you would, kids, all kids, come forward now. We'll grab a seat down here. Love to have you up here. We are working through the Trinity Kids Catechism. All right. So we talked about this slide every week. What is that? A muscle. A muscle. Who has the biggest muscles in this church? I think Moses may have. So here's, here's a key. Can I measure that? Can you measure it? Can you measure it? Okay, let's take that. All right, here we go. Ready? All right, flex it big. All right, here we go. Looks like we got it. Uh, right at 10 inches. Oh, wait. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, I don't know that. Okay, where are we at? Oh, that's uh, 8 inches. All right. So, 8 inches. So, Moses, now you have a number. Now you work it out, and you see if that arm gets bigger. Okay? Keep working at it. That gives you a base. That gives you a measurable way to know how am I getting stronger. Yes? I'm eight years old. Eight years old? So eight, eight on the arm and eight years old. Maybe when you're nine, the goal would be to have nine. Right? There you go. That's a good point. So as you're thinking about it, that's a way when you flex your muscle, you can see how big that muscle is and you can measure it. Now, if you work at it, you can get big. Okay, so that's good. We understand this concept. How do we get spiritually stronger? Is there a way to measure that? One way we can measure that is by learning these questions and answers. We can get a lot stronger by saying, oh, I didn't know any of these last week. Now I know a few more. It's incremental improvement. So let's look at one of the things, one of the questions we have today. All right, let's move to the next one. Those guys just have trouble right there. Okay. Here's a very important verse 
This is what Jesus says. Grace, would you read it really loud? Okay, what stands out to you there is there's a lot of wins there, right? And how you love God, there's a lot of wins. So let's talk about a few of these wins. So go to the next slide. All right, what does a heart look like? Yes? About the size of your fist. Yes, that's exactly right. About the size of your fist. A heart is a very tangible thing that we can, we can examine. You know, we can see it in pictures. Um, and, and we see the little... The picture of our to make that that's not actually what it looks like, right? So no. yeah, so it looks like something else. It's hard. Alright, so what's a heart like? What's an actual, what's a mind look like? Yes, it looks like this. It looks like a brain, doesn't it? That's our mind. Yeah, so a mind, that's right. You guys know what we're great so far. Alright, number two, number three. What does strength look like? Like oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You think about your, your body, your strength, right? You love, so you love God with your mind, with your heart, with your strength. Okay, next one. What's a soul look like? I don't know. I mean, that's a hard one. That, that's a hard one. It's hard one. Oh. So, that's a kind of music? Yeah, that's true. There is a kind of music. But that's doesn't tell me what it looks like. Yeah, so, but I'm saying, what is soul? What's it look like? Let's go to the next slide. I don't know. What's on the next slide? Oh, all we got is this. Here's what we got. So let's read these questions. Yeah, you want to read it? Read it loud. One second. I need to get What is soul? Is it like a soul? What eyes did God give Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve because. Do it fast. Yep. And then what's the last one? Bodies. Besides bodies, what did he give them? And so the answer is, y'all say it with me. He gave them souls that will last forever. Well, how do we know that? What's well, the next one? 20. Uh, do you have a soul as well as a body? And then you say, yes, and my soul will last forever. And then how do you know that? Because the Bible tells me so. Because the Bible tells me so. Absolutely. absolutely. We don't know what our soul is, but we're called, we don't know what it looks like, we're called to love Jesus with our soul. And how do we know what that is? It says God gave us a soul. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to love him with our soul by bringing all of who we are to him. We're going to praise him and all that he is. And we'll talk about these things next week. So let's take a moment and sing together this great song of the Lord of God and I'll pray with you. Let's pray. Right, let's sing. <coughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Take out your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. 
we're going to read in Ecclesiastes 9 this morning. I'll remind you, these are the very words of God. If you would stand in reverence for them, please. Coaleth writes, But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. It is the same for all. Since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after they, they, that they go, to the, go on to the dead. After that, they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. All the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time like fish that are taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I've also seen the example of wisdom under the sun and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise, heard and quiet, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We should try that again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. There we go. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. So we're going to be looking today at eating good food, drinking good drink, wearing good clothes, and their place in our world. As we seek to understand meaning in this life, Solomon, who calls himself the preacher, assembles us and shares his reflections on what he has seen in this life. He is a man who has had the finest drink, the finest food, the finest clothes, marriages. He's had everything that we think that anyone could want in this world. And he looks at this world and he calls it things like a toil and, and, a, and, a, and sort of a, a meaningless, vain thing sometimes. And you look at that and you wonder at it. And you see the first few verses here. That it looks like if you're looking at the scoreboard 
of how we all relate to God. It's something the scoreboard's broken. Uh, just hit that first slide with the, with the, you got it on there? Yeah, what is that? That is a, uh, it should be a picture of a scoreboard with the world's largest uh, deficit on it from a high school football game. Uh, it's, a, it's a school down in Texas. It was 90 to 7 on the scoreboard. I'll tell you, my first ever middle school football game, we were the home team and we lost 53 to 0. So this even tops what we, we experienced in our humiliation. 90 to 7. Sometimes Solomon looks at his world and his own life and he looks at his scoreboard and he feels like I'm getting humiliated here because I, I, I'm trying to do the right thing and these other guys are doing the wrong thing and they're getting a better result and, and the, the poor guys who are just trying to serve the Lord are not getting any rewards at all for their labors and, and you look at things and this world is just absolutely broken and, and he, he looks at it and you would think, well, if I'm doing the right thing, I, 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 might, I might equate, well, the nice house and the nice car and the nice family and the health and the wealth and the wisdom and the respect and the power, all that I have, even getting the best parking spots, are a result of God's favor on me because of what I'm doing. That's sort of how we function. But what if that's not your story? If you have a story of death and disease and disaster and you think about those things and you wonder, is God not really for me? How do I make sense of that? I think back over this past year and just in the course of one year on one street, three houses down on the left, which is on the south side of the street, that would be the north side, north side of the street from where I sit, we prayed for the mother of our neighbor for her healing. She was in a very bad situation. And she recovered. She's healthy. Last week, we prayed for the mother in a house three doors down on the south side of the street, and she did not recover. She's died. And you wonder, which one is favored by God? But we don't have enough data. We don't have enough data to understand what is God is doing. But I do have some data here that I want to share with you. Is this a scorecard we can observe? And I would say absolutely not. The first reason I say that when you look at the death, disease, and destruction of a home next to you and the seeming blessings on another one, let me give you two reasons why you, that's not a reliable scorecard. The first... It's to know why something happened. It's just not, no, it's not revealed to me oftentimes, unless it's in the scripture. I can't know that I know that I know what God's purposes are. Number two, to assert that any one person is owed any blessing from God is completely misunderstanding mankind's relationship with God. What does Romans 3, 9 says? It says that all people are under sin. Just look at verse 3. It says, and it says it here. It says, this is evil. All it's under the sun. The same events happens to all. Okay? And it says the hearts of the children of man are full of evil. And madness is in their hearts. So he's saying all people's hearts are full of evil and madness. So there are no such things as innocent people and guilty people or good people and bad people. Uh, there are no, there, those categories don't even make sense. A better category in our broken world, we're going to talk about the categories of sin and righteous. Sin and righteous. Are you under sin or are you righteous? Because the, the qualifications to be in God's presence and blessed is complete perfection to his holy standard. So when we're talking about these two words, sin is breaking or not keeping God's holy standard and righteous is completely keeping and never breaking God's holy standard. These are the two categories of how we relate to God. We're either in sin or we're righteous. These are the two words we need to think about. Not these are the good people or the bad people or the worst people. Okay. Now, what we're saying here is not that there aren't worse sins and worse people out there, objectively speaking. Right? Even Jesus, in John 19, 11, when he's questioned by Pontius Pilate, Jesus says that there is a scale of heinousness. Okay, listen to this. It says... 
You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. You see, he uses the category of sin and whose sin is greater and whose is lesser. So he's saying there is a greater and a worse, but still you look at the world and it's broken. And Jesus is saying, or uh, Ecclesiastes is saying, Kohelet is saying, Solomon is saying, is that there is no such thing as a scoreboard to judge your relationship with God on what you have received and what you haven't received. In fact, no one's good at all. When Jesus is, is, is actually confronted with a lawyer, he says to him, the lawyer says to Jesus, hello, good teacher. And he says, why do you call me good? Let's get definitions here. Good, what is good? No one's good but God. Jesus is very careful about his terminologies. Sin or righteous is the categories that we are under. Sin or righteous, those are the scales. We either are in complete obedience to God's revealed will and his commandments, or we're not. There's no sliding, squishy, contextualized, hey, you have this much information, and you don't, no, no, there's no, it's either you're completely in the, in, the, in the clear here, righteous or not. Even one stain means you're underneath God's judgment. So these are the categories that we have. So clearly, the ones guilty of greater sins, according to God's standards, they're further from them, they should have to pay the price for those sins, shouldn't they? Well, that's not what we see. That's not what we see. That's, that's why he says this is a great evil. You know, he looks at it and he says this is a great evil. Why is this? Solomon says that it, the guilty people ought to get a worse path and the, and the, the less guilty people ought to get an easier path. He elaborates on these categories of righteous and wicked and good and evil and clean and unclean and sacrificers and non-sacrificers and swearers and oath breakers. But those aren't the categories. It's are you under sin or are you completely keeping God's standard, which is are you righteous? These are the categories. We're talking about how we relate with God. So Solomon says in verse 3 that the world's completely broken from a human perspective, that you've got people that are absolutely awash in sin and rebellion against God, evil in their hearts, and mad, insane when it comes to God. This is our natural position. And all of this, in verse 1, comes from the hand of God. This is the plan. Because we're experiencing the madness and the evil all of our days when we walk around. Actually, we're part of the problem a lot of times. We're the, we're the people who are making other people's life more difficult. And you look at this, and, and, and as you think about this, why is that? Well, it's not a scoreboard. It's not a, it's not, I'm not getting this because I've done this uh, as something for me. I'm not the center of this world. Listen to what Samuel Rutherford says in 1628 when he wrote to a friend. He says, never believe that your tended-hearted, tender-hearted Savior who knows the strength of your stomach will mix the cup with one weight of poison. Drink then with the patience of the saints and the God of patience bless your medicine. You see that? The God who is, in, who is Christ is tender-hearted and what he's giving you is medicine, not poison. And he knows your stomach. He's made you. He knows what you can take and what you cannot take. He will, he, he, there will be temptation, and he will always give you a path out of it. He knows the way, and we trust him in that. In Isaiah 42, verse 3, he spe Isaiah speaks of the servant Christ, and it says, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will do this. It says here, a bruised reed he will not break. That's us. A faintly burning wick he will not snuff out. He will not quench us. He will not break us. He is leading us to a good place in all of the things that we endure. And you can't just see this from an under the sun perspective. Just looking at the world and thinking, well, look at the scoreboard. It looks like these people are winning and these people are losing. 
That's not how it works. And he's going to make that case. Okay, so what we observe is life is broken. That's the first point. point and that, what do we think about the remedy? What do we get? What's the remedy? Well, in verse 7 through 10, it says that the remedy here, uh, it seems to be just a, uh, a, a okay, I want to just enjoy what I have. I'm going to drink good food, or drink, uh, drink good drinks and eat good food uh, with a merry heart, he says in verse 7. For God's already approved all these things. You can't change it, so just resign yourself to it. Be happy with your great foods and your great drinks and your garments and all these things. Get it while you can. Hey, at least you're not a dead lion. Better be a living dog than a dead lion. That's what he says there. That's a, that's a great and wonderful proverb in verse 4 because, hey, who, who, I mean, lions are great, but who wants to be the dead lion? No, that's not fun. Even though dogs here in the day were not the kind of dogs we think of that are beloved pets. They're scoundrels, and no one's really excited to see a dog. They're, they're pests and savages. But he says it's better to be this despised creature than to be a dead, majestic beast, the king of the jungle. Because there's no reward for the dead. There's no reward. You don't even know what's going on, he says. So just eat, just drink. The remedy is to make your soul merry with all the things that you have. And I've sat in Bible studies with, with, with people in small groups, and, and we've talked about our, our hard times and shared our lives. And, and a lot of times what people say is, hey, I just need to go shopping. I just need to go shopping. I need to buy new things. You know, I get some new clothes. And that's, that's not what... That, that's actually kind of what Solomon is saying. Is, that, is, there any, is there any wisdom in that? We're going to see there's none. If I just get more things, that's, that's going to be the remedy. It's not the remedy. Good food, good drinks, good clothing, good possessions are gifts to be enjoyed, but they are not the joy themselves. Okay, this is the answer. So suffering, part of the plan, he knows our stomachs, he gives us the dosage to heal us and to perfect us and to bring us as his dearly loved children into the best places for us. That's what he's doing in our lives. Now, it is, though, a scientific fact that we are pleasure seekers. If you look at this uh, breakdown of our body, where's that graphic of our, our nervous system? We have more nerve endings on our face and on our, in our mouth uh, and other regions of our body uh, where we look uh, for pleasure. And these, these are like, it's just sort of like, if we keep feeding those pleasure positions, uh, those nerves, uh, those are going to be our go-to. We look for that pleasure. And that's why he picks good bread, good drink, garments, our relationships. Just enjoy those things, your marriage. Okay, because that's all we've got. We're just like animals. We're going to be here and then dead the next day. We don't even know. We could be like fish caught in a net. We don't know when our time is up. So Solomon's saying, is that all we've got? Is that all we've got? Just, just let your nerves guide you. Let your impulses guide you. And so as you're looking at this, what is he, what's he getting at when he talks about this uh, anoint your, or let your oil not be lacking on your head? I want to think about this in a way of like looking at our clothing, looking at our drink, looking at, but think about your clothing. When you get up in the morning, you might view your clothing as something, okay, I'm going to put this on because this makes me look the best. Like this makes, this is going to draw people's attention to me. Uh, this is the cutest thing I have. These are the best shoes I have for this occasion. Uh, and, and you don't want to look shabby. You don't want to, look, you don't want to mismatch. You don't look needlessly complicate people's, like, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he dressed so weird? But the goal is not to draw the eyes of people to ourselves. We ought to use modesty, decorum, reverence for the occasion, and dress ourselves in a way that brings glory to Christ. This is our great calling. We have a bigger purpose than to just enjoy the clothing we have. We have the gifts we have 
that we can enjoy and give gratitude to God. So we don't dress to attract other people to us. We dress to attract them to Christ. And that's a different way of thinking. That's wisdom. That's a, wis- that's a wisdom that actually is going to be scoffed at. What are you telling me that my clothing is not what I am? My clothing is actually what we're marking to the most. If you look at anything, uh, clothing, make the man, clothing, make the woman. Clothing is important to us. But it's, impo- it's only, a, it's only uh, a, a garment for our external, our external body. Uh, it, it doesn't, it does, it's not who we are. If you look at our, our lives and the, and the sweetness we can experience in our eating and drinking and what we wear, when you walk out of the day, ask yourself, where you go, will people honor Christ because of you? How can I honor Christ before I leave the, leave the house? So more than just looking in the mirror and saying, hey, do I look good? Pray and ask God to bring glory to Christ through you this morning. That's a better way to start. Now, when we think about enjoying our marriages, that is a hard thing. It's a hard thing to do this. We need to work at this. We should work at it. But if we make a marriage, either the pursuit of it or the sustaining of it, our ultimate joy in life, it will crush that thing. It will crush our souls because those are not what our marriages are made to do. They're not made to be our remedy in this broken world our safe place, to care for our souls. Our marriages are great and wonderful gifts. Our relationships and our friendships are great and wonderful gifts, but those things are not the ultimate relief for our broken world that we experience. Colossians 3.23 says that whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. So that means getting dressed. I get dressed for the Lord. I drink for the Lord. I eat for the Lord. I get married for the Lord. It says work heartily for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. There's a better reality. There's a better joy than the looks we get when we walk around with our great and wonderful clothing and our great and wonderful houses and cars and relationships and all that we have. Because look, we're all going to Sheol. Now Sheol here is not, in verse 10, not talking about the lake of fire, it's talking about the grave. It's the grave. We can't do anything anymore. He's saying that this is all going to be meaningless someday for us if there's nothing else in this world beyond the moment and what we can get out of it for ourselves. We've, We've expressed already that that is not God's design. Our moments are not about getting all that we can have out of it. When we come into a a union with Christ, there is a bigger and better world that we have entered into. And if you've been in that world, if you've seen the face of Jesus, you want to express that to someone else. Let me tell you a story real quick. A guy named David Livingston lived in 1813, born in 1813 in Scotland. Son of a poor family, godly parents. At age 10, he was working in a cotton factory. I've got uh, several kids that age right now, and I don't think they'd be making it in a cotton factory. Uh, No offense, guys, but that is a hard work. That's hard work as a 10-year-old, right? He became a Christian, wanted to devote his life to alleviating human misery through evangelism, exploration and emancipation. He moved to Africa, Southern Africa, in 1841 as a medical missionary. What he saw there was the slave trade, how it was killing people. He wanted to eliminate this, so he believed that if he could spread the gospel to many people and create economic opportunity, they could get rid of the slave trade. And so he prayed through that. He was a guy who had a map of Africa with a lot of areas unknown. You know, he, he actually took three long trips exploring, and he had this box he would take with him on these rivers. He, what he wanted to do was find rivers to get the goods from the middle of Africa out of Africa so that commerce could happen. And this was very successful, 
on his third trip, he takes his journal, he's writing, and he becomes a famous person, actually, through writing his journals and those being published. And they've named a city in Zambia after this man. He discovered, uh, for, as far as the, for, the, for Britain, uh, these, these falls called Victoria Falls, which makes Niagara Falls like, look like a, a, a creek. I mean, it's, a, it's beautiful things here uh, in, in Africa that, that no men outside of this continent had seen. And so he's seen all these things. He writes about them. He writes about the evils that he's, seen, that he's seen also and the heartache that this has caused. And he goes, and he goes back. He goes back to Africa. He tries to find the source of the Nile, and he dies in 1870. In 19, I believe it's 1964, Zambia, where he has a city named after this man, Livingston, he has a statue there. In 1964, the country of Zambia ceased to be under the rule of Great Britain. And most of the names changed to African, right? Livingston is still there. His statue is still there. Because this guy was Jesus to these people. He wanted to eliminate their misery through sharing the gospel of Christ, through creating economic opportunity, and exploring and making people know that these are image bearers of God and not savages. He did that. He accomplished his mission. And he's part of a big plan for God to bring many people in Zambia out of misery and into Christ. Now, these are all good things. As you consider what God is calling you to do, Satan's design is to turn you in on yourself and cause you to wonder about what people think about you. Am I wearing the right thing? Am I eating the right things? Am I, am I, am I doing the right things to get their approval? And he wants, you to, he wants you to think about yourself with God according to a scoreboard. He wants you to flatter yourself and think, well, I'm making, all the right, I'm making all the right moves here. God needs to give me some rewards. Or he will take you tenderhearted guys and say, look at what a failure you are. There's no way God can love you. This is what the devil tries to do to you. This is what your sin nature it is an easy place for your sin nature to leap onto this and say, that's who I am. But your union with Christ is your identity, which means you're going to experience a lot of glory and a lot of pain, just like Jesus. Exaltation and humiliation. As you look through this, he says here that when he looks in the final analysis of this chapter, he says, I've seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. He talks about a siege. A siege. Now, what is a siege? A siege is one of the promised curses that God's people would endure if they did not worship him alone and they worship other gods. And you see throughout history that men like uh, uh, from Syria and, and Assyria and, and Babylon came to God's people and sieged their cities. And they brought much pain on them, right? A siege will, will, will cut all your resources off and even in Deuteronomy 28, it says, if you experience this, there will be cannibalism. There will be heartache and suffering. A siege is one of the worst things you can go through. I know we've got quarantines and mandates and all these other things, but we have nothing like a siege. A siege was awful. And he, used, he points out that picture because you think about God's people were sieged. They were enslaved, first of all. They were freed slaves. They're led in this land by Moses, the promised land by Joshua. They set up a kingdom. There's a king. They start to worship other gods. And God sends a siege. How do they get, how do they get rescued from that? The answer is, they ultimately did not get rescued. They were shattered. And Hundreds of years later, a redeemer would come, a poor man, and he would bring rescue from the siege 
a man whom no one was looking for. Right? Look at what it says here. Uh, there's a little city in verse 14 with few people in it. A great king came against it, besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man. He, by his wisdom, delivered the city, yet no one remembered that poor man. And I say, better is wisdom than might. This poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Could there ever be a more accurate picture of Christ, even though Solomon may have had no idea he was going to be talking about Christ in this passage? And I say, your deliverance is not through your beauty, your possessions, your relationships. It's through Christ. And that wisdom is despised. And you must be diligent to hide that in your heart, lest you sin against him. You need to be diligent about declaring these rules from your mouth, the rules of what true wisdom is. This is what the psalmist in Psalm 119 says to us. He tells us this. But what we must confess, too, is that we can't just know this thing and know this story of Christ. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us these things. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, it says this. As it's written, what no eye has seen, what no, eye has, no ear has heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God's revealed to us through the Spirit. The same Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of the person, which is in him alone. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God takes the thoughts of God and it says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. If you look back at verse 8, it says, Let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. You must put on the garments of white, which is usually associated with worship here, and the anointing, which is associated with, with, with ordination, and profess your faith each and every day. You are becoming a professional Christian that you profess what you believe about wisdom and life through the way you deal with people. You're going to go to Zambia or you're going to go to the office and you're going to pr promote Christ through your words. Now, I don't, I, when you think about these things, no one can understand this. Honestly, no one can understand this. This is folly. It says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But we believe that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is wisdom. It's Christ. So as we think about this, what does Christ say we are? Well, it says the meek will inherit the earth. This is something we need the Spirit to teach us. Showing someone a verse that says the meek will inherit the earth, we can't read that. That's like John Giuliano knows this about calculus. He studied calculus, but if I give someone who doesn't know anything about calculus a calculus book, you can't understand it. Like you can, you can, you can kind of get, it's about math, but if you don't have any kind of understanding of what this is, you have no idea what you're talking about. If you look at the gospel and those beatitudes, blessed are those, the meek who inherit the earth. How in the world does that make sense? How does the meek inherit the earth? What is meek? Meek does not mean weak. Meek means I'm about someone besides myself. I'm a part of a greater kingdom. And this kingdom is coming to the earth and God's favorite planet, which he made with his favorite creatures, will not be abandoned. But we, those who are focused on Christ, who love the Lord Jesus and would never want to be without him, will finally have what our souls desire, which is him. We'll be walking with him. We'll see his face. And this is the wisdom of the wise. Satan's desire is to turn you in on yourself to consider what you have. But blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We can give up what we have. And if e we, what we can have is looking at our eagerness for this. How eager are we for heaven? 
How satisfied are we right now? How eager are we for heaven? How eager are we for Jesus? I'll close with this. In our daily devotional at our table at dinner the other day, we asked the question, would you want to go to heaven if Jesus were not there? And it's a good question. Would you want to go there if Jesus wasn't there? I mean, you get a lot of good things in heaven, right? You might get your, your family back that you've lost, uh, uh, streets of gold, all, you know, all that, like the, the, the joys. But the answer is, think about this. If you, go to your, if you went to your parents' house for Thanksgiving or your friends' house for Thanksgiving or anyone for Thanksgiving's house this week, what if you went there and all the food was there, but they were not there? How sad would this be? It's infinitely more so if we were in heaven without Christ. It would be hell. And hell with Jesus would be heaven. Our location and what we have, whether it be food, drink, clothing, doesn't matter. It's are we with Christ? This is the key that we must know. Where he is, there is blessing. And it gives me all the reason in the world to be meek. To be like this man who went to Zambia for the sake of alleviating misery through the efforts of evangelism and eliminating injustices and creating economic opportunities in all these ways. Let's pray. Lord, we ask now that you would grant us uh, your spirit to work alongside your word. Lord, we know that if we do not have your spirit, that we will not be anointed for our days to go and proclaim you and profess what we believe about you and your goodness. It will be a fool's errand. We need your spirit to anoint us, that we might look in the mirror each and every day and pray and ask for you to direct our days. And we might ask for you to uh, store up this word in our hearts so we might not sin against you. Lord, we ask that these things would be real to us, uh, these heavenly things, that we've meekly let go of all that we have, uh, that we might gain life with you when you return to be with us, that that would be our greatest joy. Lord, we ask for these, uh, these words to impact us, that we wouldn't walk around with this uh, nihilistic, uh, meaningless uh, view of life. But may we see past uh, the reality under the sun and see your hands governing all things, giving us good medicine that we can grow from in our want and our plenty. May we be content in Christ to do all things that you've called us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's get to it. Our next uh, order of worship is the Lord's table. As we move to the Lord's table, let me give you a few instructions. This uh, table is for all believers who are in Christ. It's a joy uh, in that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a small little picture of what we're going to one day have with God. We're going to be sitting in the presence of the Father. And Father, like we said earlier, is the Christian word to God. It's the name for God. It is not a known religion. But if you do not call God Father, then this is not for you. This is for those who are children. We want to be at the Father's table. And we'll throw off all sin and the hands of it. Get to that table. It's Christ who made the way. We want to be with him. That's who this is for. That's what it says. So if this is not, that's, that's not your testimony. Let this go by. Come to Jesus. That is the call to me today. Let's come to Christ. You'd be better to be with him than anywhere else I promise you. Anywhere you can dream, you in Christ is the only way. Now, what he gave us was two signs. He gave us bread and he gave us wine. We have on the tables in the back bread and we have wine and juice. You can pick which one you want. There'll be on napkins back there, the individual servings for you to take. In a moment, I'll break the bread and hold up the wine and institute the supper. supper. You will go in to get your portion, come back, we'll be singing a hymn. See the first two verses of that Let's now pray as we prepare for this. Our God in heaven, we ask now that you would take bread and drink. And may that the things symbolize be sweet to us in the sweet tasting bread and the sweet tasting bread. For it is as true as those things are sweet to our taste buds, 
and what awaits our souls and our resurrected bodies for the Lord. It's infinitely sweeter. Fairer than 10,000 times what we can experience in the sweetest of dreams, the sweetest dreams. What we ask now that you would convict us of these things and how we turn away from them and serve our own selves and, and neglect our neighbor. And we don't proclaim the truth in our professions. But we ask now that you forgive us, call us to repent, call us to love you more earnestly in our hearts and gratitude for the victory out of Christ. And whatever for we be more. By your grace, we ask for spirit to anoint us in this way. I say. And I am to betray, to bread, I can give you thanks, Jesus broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you, take me all of it. And after the bread, he took the cup and said, this is the uh, new covenant in my blood, poured out for the of your sin, for the forgiveness of your sins. Take him here. As often as you do this, you pray my death, and I come again, do this in the name of I ask you to go now, grab your, grab your cup, grab your bread, and turn to your seat and sing together. a few words before we get out of here today and sing the rest of this wonderful hymn. But if you would, consider a few things this week. I know it's an odd time with, with COVID uh, restrictions and whatnot, but we intend uh, for, the, for the time being to continue meeting and we'll continue to take great precautions uh, to, to make sure everyone is as safe as possible. And we do intend to continue our Monday and Tuesday meetings. So Monday, we're going to be meeting at uh, Big Brew this week on Main Street. At 5, we'll be praying, and then 5.30, we'll be uh, having some drinks together at Big Root. And then Tuesday morning, we'll have a men's Bible study at 6.30 a.m. at Rudy's. Now, why are we doing these things? Uh, ultimately, uh, I would love for these things to be used uh, that we might, you know, 
a hundred years after our deaths, be remembered as someone who blessed Norman, uh, someone who Norman would be happy to have here, actually. Uh, even though they, they, some of them might disagree with us, but many of them would be converted uh, to Christ through our ministry. And that's why we're here. We want to do things uh, here in this building and things in this world so that we know and serve our neighbors and meet them. Uh, and these are just two of the avenues to do that. So, so we want to be a blessing and eliminate the misery that we see. Uh, and it's mainly not, through, it's in all different ways, but the ministry that we see, uh, Christ and our relationships with others is the way to that end, we believe. So these are the things uh, we commend you this week. Are there any other announcements this morning? Uh, just to, yeah, those are a couple things. If you want to, if you want to think about uh, uh, those things, consider those things. Uh, we hope to have a few more things coming up this uh, this uh, Christmas season as well. Uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, and uh, if you do not have the app yet, please get that. If you'd like to give today, you can give through uh, the app, through the plates in the back. I didn't mention that earlier, but the plates in the back, and also through online uh, giving on our website, trinitynorman.com. Those are the ways, and that, those instructions should be on your. Uh, handout. Our final hymn this morning will be the close of this wonderful hymn, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken, and we'll sing verses three through five to wrap it up today. If you'll please stand with us. I pray that uh, you and I will find great comfort in singing these things throughout the week. Uh, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken. So if you look up and receive the benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace.